Okay, today we are going to uh, talk about memory, <coughs> preparing to present. And the reason we're talking about memory next week will be delivery. <coughs> today is memoria, to use the Latin word. Next week, presentatio. Um, that is based upon the five canons of rhetoric which we have been dealing with. This is the strategy I've taken in this communication in, in homiletics class. That rhetoric, the use of language to instruct and persuade a listener or reader, um, and language to me is defined by the historic, the traditional disciplines of logic and grammar. The five canons of rhetoric we've talked about, uh, starting with Aristotle, but even more so with the Latin, uh, Roman speakers, uh, Cicero and, and others. Uh, invention, that is deciding what you want or need to say and why you need to say it. Arrangement, or organizing the argument or message for the best effect. That is, what, how do I structure or organize my message? Style, by what approach can I best communicate this message to this audience? Today, memory, learning and or memorizing the argument or message. How can I best be prepared to effectively deliver this message to this audience? And then let the next, uh, next week deliver it. The gestures, pronunciation, tone and pace used when presenting. How can I best present the message? So today we're dealing with memoria, as it is in Latin, or memory. This was... Um, in ancient Greece, we need to understand that many of the texts that we have from ancient times, like Homer's Odyssey and Iliad, were originally not written down. They were memorized, and they were presented, and only later did someone else decide to write these things down for us. This is true for almost all ancient literature, that it all started out as oral tradition, and then later got written down. Now, in fact, almost all of the ancient Greek texts that we still have, are aware of, or, and find so valuable, were originally oral presentations that a student or a, a hearer would write down. When the Romans came along, there was more written material under the Romans than there were under the Greeks, but still, the most important uh, social interactions all occurred as oratory. That's how the legal system worked, that's how the political system worked, that's how public discussion of issues, it was debate, it was public discourse by multiple people. And unlike any sort of speaking arrangements or engagements that we have today, in ancient times, they did not use notes. They never read their speeches. They did not work from any written documents. Um, in fact, a good orator was partly defined by their ability not to have to use any of those kinds of things. I'm going to talk a little bit later about it. Um, Socrates said that being able to write, he did not advocate writing. Socrates did not believe in writing because he said if you write, you will you're weaken your mind. You will forget the things you need to remember and you should instead memorize things. This idea of memoria pa has passed down through history. Originally children, uh, in Renaissance times for instance, children were instructed to memorize things by rote memorization. The closest example we have of that is the multiplication tables. You know, before you really understood anything about math, you were taught the multiplication tables. One times one is one, one times two is two, you know, one times three is three, etc. Um, I still have to, have to, I'll go seven times eight, seven, seven is 49, 56, you know. I still do that. Uh, but, so the idea in, in Renaissance times, is they would be taught things by rote memorization and then later would be taught how to understand it. In other words, what it means. But the idea of memorizing as a first step has always been sort of understood. In fact, some of the earliest printed documents after the Gutenberg Bible were memory tables created for children. Things they could memorize in order to have basic information that they may not be able to understand yet, but they were taught to memorize it. Uh, so, for in rhetoric, for the speakers, the orators, or rhetors, as they are called, um, memory was a critical part of this process. And when we talk about memory, or memoria in Latin, we, we don't just mean memorizing a talk, so that you have it memorized in your mind. We also mean um, having the ability to uh, extemporize on the topic at a wider range. You will remember earlier on in this course, I talked about the fact that one of the one of the things that we need to pursue is a wide range of reading. Read everything. Be interested in things. You know, have a wide scope of stuff that you take in that you learn about. You know, be interested in stuff. Um, 
my experience has been that's often the key difference between somebody who's an interesting speaker or preacher and somebody who's not. Well, this was considered a requirement in rhetoric that the person who was an orator needed to have a wide range of experience, not just memorize their particular thing, but have a wide range of understanding, things they had learned, if not memorized, that they could call upon in, in order to facilitate or, or to add to. Quite often in Greek and, and Roman times, the rhetoric occurred in a public forum where there was interaction. And if you just memorized a speech, it was not static the way most speeches or sermons are today. You had to be able to do more than just deliver the words you had planned on. You had to be able to interact with people on it, which meant you had to know more than just what you said. Um, and that required both an understanding when you were preparing, an understanding of what might be needed in the future, but also you had to be able to think, in effect, think on your feet, is the expression we use. You had to know enough about it and have enough absorbed content that you could interact with your own thoughts and with other people's responses to them while you were in process. Not, it was n almost never a static kind of thing. Now in terms of memorization, I'm going to get into this a little bit later, um, one of probably the most effective system which was invented in ancient times for memorizing, even memorizing large quantities of information, is what's called the method of loci, or it's often called the memory palace. Are you familiar with that expression? Um, memory palace. Um, this is what is used you, almost unanimously or universally by all um, people who specialize in feats of memory today. And there are national and international competitions for memorizing. And memory palace is what they all use. It was invented in very ancient times. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, I, from time to time, will hear people today say, oh, I just can't memorize anything. Well, then you're lazy. We can memorize things. It is a discipline like any other discipline. And you pursue it. You, you may start out bad at it, but you can get better at it. And there are particular ways you, and I'm going to give you some of those today, particular ways you can get better at remembering things. Um, and I'm going to talk about whether that means memorizing everything or memorizing key points, or and we're also going to talk about how to use outlines and various strategies for how you do presentation. I, I, I'm, a lot of the, this I'm saying uh, preaching or teaching or I'll talk about sermons or classes. I, I'm just going to set that all aside. I'm, talking, I'm going to say sermons and preaching. But understand that these same things can be applied to any kind of environment where you're teaching, preaching, leading, you know, have some sort of some content to present. So let's talk about memoria. Again, it's the discipline of recalling the arguments of the discourse. Sermon, class, whatever. It's the process for recalling the arguments. Now that may be, when we say memory, we think having it all in here without anything outside. Well, one of the one aspect of the discipline of recalling the arguments may be an effective use of notes. So we're not precluding that with this definition. The recalling may be facilitated. So that's not outside this. Although it has been universally agreed upon that that the less you have to rely on notes, the better it is. So, we'll get to that. Um, this is probably the aspect of rhetoric, the five canons of rhetoric, that has been written about the least because real, there's really not that much to say about it. Well, I'm going to get into more detail today than is usual because I'm going to introduce you to some other things and we're going to deal with it's kind of a modern approach to note taking and highlighting and all that sort of stuff. But um, when we when we deal with memoria, we are, memoria is most often related to arrangement, which is the second of them, that is how you structure your talk. And the reason for that, very simply, is the structure of your sermon or talk, teaching, will have a great effect on how well you can remember it. A scattered, you know, disconnected, uh, disorganized sermon is going to be a lot harder for you to remember than one that is sequential and makes sense and is has brevity, you know, it doesn't say more than it has to, and yet it follows, you know, you, you have a clear sense of what the flow of the thing is. If you, it's organized well in terms of your arrangement, then it will be much easier for you to remember the points and to be able to glance down and recognize where you are and where you're going, you know, what's next, etc. So organization or arrangement is closely related to this idea of memoria or being able to remember either freestanding extemporaneously or with the use of various tools. Now, um, 
Rhetoricians insist that memoria, as I said, involves, I already touched on this, involves much more than just rote memorization. It involves having a knowledge, a memory if you will, of a wide range of related information that allows you to improvise, to answer questions, to refute opposing uh, arguments, etc. Now, one of the reasons that how you approach memory is important in terms of the content of your message is because we talked before what I jokingly call the three musketeers of rhetoric, ethos, logos, and pathos. Those are, ethos, for instance, is how you come across, you know, if, if your sweater is button crooked, everybody's going to be noticing that, they're not going to pay attention to what you have to say. You know, if your nose is running and people are getting grossed out, they're not going to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Whatever it is, well, similarly, one aspect of ethos, how you present yourself, is there is greater credibility from someone who is not dependent upon notes, certainly as somebody who doesn't just read, than, you know, than otherwise. In other words, if somebody is able to stand up there and they clearly um, know the material so well, they're not heavily dependent upon written, the written notes or manuscript or whatever, they are going to come across with more confidence, they're going to be able to have more eye contact, they're going to relate more with people. That's better. The less you have to rely on what's down here, then the better you're going to be in effectively communicating with people. One thing, for instance, um, with real, they say eye contact. Well, you can't have eye contact if you're having to read. It doesn't work. So where do you find your balance in that? And we'll talk about that in some detail today. But they've, they've said that if someone has something read to them, they have a 47% retention rate on average. I mean, you don't figure because people today don't retain much of anything. But hearing somebody read something is 47%, but having them present it to you eyeball to eyeball, they have like a 66% retention rate. So it's not just a matter of it looking better. People really will get your information, your message. They will be impacted more if you have less reliance upon notes, written material. The more that you can speak directly to them, the more impact and effect you will have. So that's why it's worth pursuing this seriously. All right? Questions about any of that? Okay, let's talk about the three elements of canon memory. This is historically part of rhetoric in the memoria. There's three pieces. The first one, the obvious one, is memorizing one's speech. Again, centuries ago, ancient orators would memorize and present their speeches. They used no note cards, they used no crib sheets, they used no manuscripts. They learned this stuff and presented it. Uh, and I'll give you the exact quote from Socrates. This is recorded in Phaedrus. Plato quotes Socrates as saying this. If men learn this, that is, how to write notes, how to take notes for themselves. If men learn this, it will implant forgetfulness in their souls. They will cease to exercise memory because they rely on that which is written, calling things to remembrance no longer from within themselves. I think he was right. Our brains have been weakened partly because we rely so heavily on things being written down and less on memorization. Um, when we memorize, for instance, the Word of God, we always have to be able to us. We don't have to go looking for it somewhere. And yet we have really lost this as a discipline, this most ancient and most valued of disciplines. We have really hurt ourselves in that regard. The ancient Greeks, if someone used notes for any sort of oratory, they were considered weak-minded and they were laughed at. They had any kind of notes. Um, as I said, how we use our memory during a speech affects how well we can influence the audience. In terms of ethos, how we're perceived, there is a greater sense, and tests have shown this, that people have a greater sense of trustworthiness from a speaker. You know, they trust a speaker who looks at them when they talk rather than when they look, they're looking down, reading the notes. And some of it has to do with um, today we have a, an orientation almost entirely on the content. Do I have good content in my message? Well, we could. We focus on that to the extent that we've stopped realizing that presentation has a serious impact on that. This, again, this, the recent studies that show that having somebody look at you when they talk to you, you'll retain them much more of what they say. In ancient times, they had more, more concern about presentation because they realized that that had as much or even more effect on how, pe how the audience responded. And that was the point, after all. That's the point of communication, is how 
Are the people receiving my communication responding? And so we have focused so much on content, we think it's more important to, you know, to read the stuff and get it literally accurately correct than to realize that speaking to people face to face, eye to eye, is going to have more impact and come accomplish our goal better. Now I mentioned to you, with regard to memorization, the memory palace, or mind palace, technically it's called the method of loci, or, which means the method of places. Um, this is something that Kikoro advocated, uh, ancient writers and scholars advocated, and what it does is it uses visualization. I mean, you've all seen the, you know, the telemarketing, or the telemarketing, the, the TV commercials where, say, purchase month for $29.95, I can guarantee you'll never forget somebody's name again. And they give you just a little taste of it, or maybe you've actually taken this memory, these memory things, where they say you look at somebody's face and come up with some image or connection of words that remind you of that. And so next time you're trying to remember the name, you think of that image. He looks like a blue mule. Okay, whatever. <laughs> well, this is the same basic process that they use in Memory Palace, which means it's called Memory Palace because you create in your mind a geographical setting, a palace, your house, the favorite street that you have, and when you're trying to remember something, you associate each thing you're trying to remember with some point along that street, you know, as you walk through your house, along that walk, whatever. Now, that sounds weird to people who have never done it, if you've never practiced that discipline, but this is the technique that is used by all people today who are involved in feats of memory. Um, international competitions in memory uh, retention started in 1991. The U.S. had their first championship in 1997. People are called upon to remember and recall sequences of digits, two-digit numbers, alphabetical letters, or playing cards. Using the people who do this say that even somebody who's not experienced at it can, with less than an hour's practice, be able to memorize the order of a whole 52 card deck. In fact, the, the world record for that is held. Simon Reinhardt memorized the 52 the order of all 52 cards in a shuffle deck in 21.19 seconds. That's how long it took him using the memory palace technique. Um, the uh, uh, fellow from Germany, Clement Myers, who was the one of the world champion memory guys, he has, he uses the same thing all the time. He's got a 300 point journey through his house. And whenever he's trying to memorize something, he associates every point along that 300 point walk through his house to something. He was able to memorize 1,040 random digits in a half an hour. Um, a man named Gary Shang used the same method of memory palace to memorize pi to over 65,000 characters. Now, we're astonished by this, but the point I'm making in all of that is there are methods, and this is the most popular one, the memory palace, and it's been around for thousands of years, whereby we can discipline ourselves to learn and memorize scripture, telephone numbers, people's names, and most particularly with regard to our particular, this class, the content of a sermon that we're going to offer, or a teaching, or whatever else it is. There are ways that you can memorize things. There are techniques that you can pursue, and you need to learn those things. And again, I've had people say, oh, I can't memorize anything. And my response is, well, that's the laziest thing anybody could possibly say. What you're telling me is, you're not even going to try. Right? That's what that means when somebody says, I can't do that. That means I'm not even going to try. It means you won't. You won't, exactly. You won't. And yet, can. All right. So that's the first is memorizing one's speech or sermon or teaching. Second, the second element of the canon of memory is making one's sermon, speech, memorable. This is a different, this is the flip side of the coin. Remember, the ancients were as concerned about presentation, perhaps more concerned about presentation than they were about content, because they knew that the presentation would be what people remembered. And that the best way to be effective in communication was to was that your presentation caused them to remember as much as that you communicated content. And so um, it has to do with excellence of presentation, not just excellence of content. And we need to learn that because our culture does not think that way. And yet, 
That's, that makes a huge difference. The third is keeping a treasury of rhetorical folder. Again, these are traditionally part of rhetorical memoria. That means you, if you are a speaker, if you are a rhetorician, if you are a preacher, a teacher, you always need to be alert to things that will help you in your process. Images, thoughts that you have, quotes that you come across. Most of the people I know that do this well, they'll, they have files. You know, idea files, creative files, and they'll maintain that stuff. And you need to do it, if not formally, quotes, facts, etc. If not formally, you at least need to be attuned enough that when you come across something, you go, that's really good. And try to remember it. Okay, but it's best to actually try to keep a folder. Um, and if you're going to do this with any sort of regular or professional kind of approach, then you do need to be doing that. Now, there's a caution here. I have known people, like when I was in seminary, I knew other people in seminary. And somebody could hear a good illustration and go, that's a really cool illustration. I'm going to have to think of a sermon to go around it. That's not the way to create a sermon. Okay, we talked about that when we talked about... You know, the, the first inventio, you know, how you first decide what am I going to say and why am I going to say it to this audience. You don't start with an illustration and, and then force a sermon around it. But um, to, to note things so that when the time comes you're creating a sermon, those things will come back to you or you have uh, sources. I've, I've said in this class before that um, more so when I'm teaching, but it also happens when I'm preaching, I have had to be careful that I don't over-plan illustrations and things. Again, especially early on in teaching, I would try to structure everything. And okay, here I'm going to tell the story about the blue elephant, and here I'm going to do that. And it was stilted, it's stiff. What I discovered is from time to time when I'm preparing, I, an illustration or you know something will come to me and I'll make a note of it. But 75% of the illustrations, the color commentary, the stories that I do when I'm teaching come to me in the process. And that's just who I am. Well, I'm the sort of person that I hear those things, and I'm interested in stuff, and so I remember them. And I don't, I, I don't think in advance where I'm going to use them, but they come up later, you know. Um, and the more you do it, the more that will be the case for you as well. All right? Now, when we get into this, I'm going to confess some of my own weaknesses in this. I'm going to tell you about my process, which we talked about some already when I gave you guys a copy of the sermon and everything. But um, I am committing myself to start changing some things about how I preach. Some things that I, I knew I wanted to change before and I've really been pushed to it by this. So we'll talk, about, we'll talk about that too. First, let's talk about some practical approaches to memorial, to memory. How you prepare yourself before getting in the pulpit to make sure you're ready to do it. Okay? And these are practical. There are five ways or five distinct approaches that you can take, I'm sure there may be six, seven, or eight, but five obvious ones, that you can take as an approach in preparing to offer sermon. First is you can write out your sermon and then memorize it. There are some great preachers that do that. I think I've told the story in here before about um, uh, the chaplain of the U.S. Senate who was at Hollywood Presbyterian Church, Gloria Ogilvy. Great preacher. I mean, the guy had the voice of God. He really did. Big, booming bass voice. And um, he would memorize his sermon, stand in the middle of the platform in his reform robes, no notes, no note cards or anything, and preach every week. And he once had a case where, and this shows you the danger of this, he was that good, and he was really good at it, a great preacher. But he got up one time and said, and after all, when things get tough, the tough get... And you can see in his mind, He's going, things get tough, the tough get things. No, that's not right. <laughs> so he said, when things get tough, the tough get going. Well, there's danger. No matter how good you are at this, there's always a danger if you, if you memorize. Just one slip, especially if you're using an aphorism like that, and you find yourself back into a corner. Uh, but that is an option. And some of the great preachers in the past, and some today, but more so in the past, actually would write their sermons out, and then memorize them. If you're up for that, go for it. I think it's still a good idea to have some notes, even if it's just a note card you paint. Um, and, and going without any notes at all, I think, is unnecessary and unwise. Okay. The question is, what kind, how much notes? Secondly, 
you can write out your sermon and then take that full manuscript into the pulpit with you. Ideally, with highlighting, underlining, etc. Now, this is what I do. I write out my sermons, and I don't. I what I used to do is I would write them out and I would leave a wide left-hand margin. Let's call it a scholar's margin. And then I would I would and we'll get it we'll get to this. When we talk about highlighting, underlining. I would would in, even with a magic marker in a bold. I would write key words on the left-hand side, and then I would highlight uh, key things uh, throughout, so that I had I could glance down and I had these big sort of points, either highlighted parts or these big words that would tell me where I am and where I'm going. Just one words that one word or two words that would key for me, uh, you know, what, what my big points were, where where I am. I don't do that anymore. I work from a manuscript, and I don't think I should. In fact, Carolyn, if she was in here, she's got to tell her about work telephone call right now. Um, I've been telling her forever that, and, and I've sort of set the goal that when I'm in the new church, I want to start doing this more. I want to preach without notes, or at least without a full manuscript. Um, I want to, as much as possible, preach without notes, although I believe, as I said, it's wise to have something in case, you know, you go far and <laughs> you've got something that you can refer to and pull you back into reality. Um, so that's, that's another approach, is write out your sermon, then take the full manuscript with you, and that's what I do, but that's what I want to change. I'll tell you how. Third, work from an outline of the sermon. Now, a number of people who deal and, and, and still do the same thing, I mean, you use, and we'll talk about outline in a, in a few minutes in more detail, you use indentation, you use um, highlighting, you use various other kinds of things to sort of help you through it, to let you follow uh, where you, remember where you are and follow to the next point. But um, most people who say to do this suggest that you not start with a full manuscript and then outline it. That it's better just to do an outline. And then if you want to have a full manuscript, either for publication or for distribution, whatever, after you preach the thing, go back and do the full manuscript. Now my problem, the reason I work with a full manuscript, when I preach, not when I teach, when I preach, it's because I sit down to, I sit down to try to do an outline, and the next thing I know, I'm writing whole paragraphs. Because this stuff starts coming out, and instead of doing an outline, I'm going, oh darn, I've done it again. <laughs> you know, i got a whole page worth of copy here, and I was just going to have highlight points for an outline. And so, that's, that's who I am. But I, I, I want to change some of that, because I think there's a better way to do it. But I work from a manuscript. But outline, and just an outline to start, rather than write the whole thing out and then outline it, um, is perhaps the best way to go. I... I love language, and so when I start trying to do an outline, I get phrases, and I get illustrations, and those things start coming to me, and so I write them down, and the next thing you know, i got, you know, pages of text. So, yes, Chris? Just out of curiosity, why are you, why are you going to change it? Well, bec primarily because I believe, and I'll talk a little bit later, I'll give you some quotes and talk a little bit later about the value of not being trapped behind the pulpit, and not being stuck with your manuscript or even your outline. Now that means I will have an outline, but I want to have more freedom of that. And so it involves several things. One, it involves the process of creating the document. But it also involves, um, I mean, the, the, literally what, what kind of document you produce, I should say. And the other is timing and, uh, you know, when you do this. Because one of the things, if you're going to have complete freedom from standing behind a pulpit and going through using a manuscript, is you've got to spend a lot more time getting it in here rather than just not here. Okay. And that's a big part of it. Um, and that's one of the ways that I really fail. I mean, how many, most of y'all have heard me preach? I'm, I'm putting myself out there now. Um, I think, Chris, you haven't. You've heard, you've heard me on, you online, but you haven't seen me. Oh, you have to see me. Uh, well, I've heard a lecture on Friday morning, so. Yeah, that's that's different. See, that's teaching. That's yeah. teaching. And I, I, I'll start teaching, you know, I'll have, I'll have all the notes and everything. I'll start teaching and then all of a sudden say, whoa, wait a minute, I'm like 20 pages past that, you know, and I'll be looking for it. I, I don't do that when I'm preaching. Uh, and, and I'll just ask you all, do you feel like it's real obvious that I'm, I'm following a manuscript? Okay. Um, and yet I am. It's, everything is written out. I mean, I gave you all a copy. You were not here, but I gave everybody else a copy of it. So you can see how detailed. And that was what I, what I gave you was what I had in the pulpit. 
Okay, there was no more notes, there was no more highlighting. That was exactly what it was. I underlined things and I bold faced things, or, or now. I used to do a lot more, but now that's all I do. Now, I think, and please understand, I'm, I'm doing this in the process of learning. I think I'm pretty good at that. But I think I can be better if I'm not stuck to that manuscript. Now that will involve two things. It will involve me having a different preparation process, and more than anything else, it will involve me doing things more in advance. I still, I mean, I'll know what I'm going to preach on, I'll know what the topics are, I have the resources and everything else, but I do a lot of my work on Saturdays, and then I always get up at early on Sunday morning, early like 5 a.m. or 5.30 a.m. the latest, and I do work on Sunday morning, and I'll still be editing stuff. Now, I hope it doesn't come across that I'm, you know, I'm not really ready when I get up there, but, because uh, I do feel ready. I mean, that's been my process, and that's what I've fallen into, and I think it's good, but I think it can be better. Um, and so, even if I feel like I'm preaching well, I can preach better. You know, good is the enemy of great, and I'm going to do the best for the people that are there that I can. You know, as God desires. Yes? I think the, the freedom that you feel when you're not tied to the pulpit, and especially telling, uh, and giving an illustration or telling a story. You know it well, uh, and you've got it up here. So to move away from the pulpit and uh, to be animated or or to use a visual uh, really captures the audience uh, right. so much better than standing at the public. So I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Totally. And so I'm committed to trying to do that. You guys can hold me accountable to it. Uh, but that means in order to have enough time to really get saturated, we'll talk about saturation in a few minutes, to get so sufficiently saturated and spend time memorizing, whether everything or you know sufficient memorization to use just an outline um, will will require that I have a different timeline as well as a different, different process so that's a big deal uh, but uh, Tiger Woods maybe shouldn't use an example now but Tiger Woods <laughs> right at the height of his career disassembled and changed his swing because he said I can be better than this uh, I'm not saying I'm Tiger Woods in the pulpit or anything but but the idea is that just because things seem to be going fairly well doesn't mean you can't do something to get better at it. So that's my commitment for me, and I want that to be your commitment for you too, okay? So, um, write out your sermon, then memorize it, write out your sermon, and then take a manuscript that is highlighted, marked up, whatever works for you in the pulpit. We'll talk about some details of that later. And then, or work from an outline of the sermon. Then, or, fourth option, know your topic so well that you neither memorize, nor do you work from a script or outline but you perhaps maybe only have a few notes on one page. Um, has anybody here ever heard Earl Homer preach? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Earl was my pastor for almost 20 years. He's a dear friend. You know, I, I, he married Carolyn and I, uh, you know, heard him preach hundreds of times, hundreds and hundreds of times, and, uh, and teach as well. Earl's preparation is on Monday night, he will take a a yellow pen. He doesn't use computers. His secretary still prints out his emails for him. He will take a yellow pad and he will handwrite a few, you know, a few notes. When I say a few, like three or four, on one side of the piece of yellow paper, yellow pad paper, and then they turn it over and make three or four more, more notes. And that's all he has. That's all he uses. And then he'll think about it, pray about it during the week, and preach on Sunday. And Saturday night is family time for them. He never does anything Saturday night. In fact, when he took over our church, many, you know, 20, 30 years ago, plus, um, they were, they had started having Saturday night services, and he said, no, oh, Saturday night's family time. We don't, you know, and so they, they did a Sunday night service instead. Well, Earl is brilliant. I mean, really brilliant <laughs> um, at, at preaching. He's a great preacher, and yet he's got 30 words, maybe, on a piece of paper, and that's it. So, this can work, but you got to be good at it. I'm pretty sure, I don't, I don't know this for a fact, but I would bet that Earl didn't start that way. Okay, he didn't. Um, he, he began as the, the university ministries uh, pastor at University Presbyterian Church in Seattle the week Carolyn and I were born. Um, because we actually were looking at an antique Bible in a bookstore in Seattle, and we opened it, and there was a bulletin from that week. Um, the week we were born at, you know, in, uh, from University Presbyterian Church, and they were installing Earl as the minister of campus ministries. That was his first job. 
and he left later and went to Berkeley and then came back as the senior pastor. We gave that to him, you know, as, as a memory of when he was uh, scholar and said this was when we were born. So um, I doubt that when he started that he had sufficient background knowledge, confidence to be able to do that. Maybe he did. I don't know that for a fact, but I, it's unlikely. Because I don't see somebody being able to do that when they're, you know, 24 years old or whatever and just out of seminary. So, but it is possible to do that well. And the fifth, the last way is wing it. <laughs> not, not recommended. There are still people who say, well, I get, I get up there on Sunday morning and I count on the Holy Spirit to inspire me for what needs to be said. That's irresponsible. That's failing to understand the way the Holy Spirit works, I think. Because the, that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit, you know, and, and they, they quote the scripture where it says, when you are brought up before the authorities, don't give any concern about what to, what to say because they will, you know, the Holy Spirit will give you the word you need. Very true if you get called up before the authorities. That's not like getting called up in front of a congregation every Sunday to preach. Um, the Holy Spirit can inspire you in your study during the week just as well as he can in the pulpit. Again, that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit might not inspire you to go in some different direction. Um, you know, you, something comes to you when you're up there or you feel it needs to be said. That's absolutely, you know, listen to the Spirit. But, again, a lot of that's laziness. You know, I just get up there and wing it. Not a good idea. Um, Earl may only have a piece of paper with, you know, a few words on one side and a few words on the other. But he's been doing this for enough years and he knows exactly where he's going. He knows exactly what illustrations he's got it all up here. He is not winging it. So there's a difference. So those are the, the approaches that can be taken. Um, now, there is a distinct advantage, I believe, and I've, I've already said this several different ways, but um, to preaching without notes, which is where I want to go. To be able to be free from being behind the pulpit. Uh, I actually was in, I used to do public speaking when I was in high school. They had competitions at East, Eastern uh, East Tennessee State University, and we would go there a couple times a year for these. And I did a um, oral interpretation of dramatic literature and declamation and extemporaneous speaking where they would give you a topic and you had, you know, an hour to prepare and different things. Well, I remember one of the first times I ever went, um, usually you'd go in and they'd have a speaker stand or a podium or something, and on um, which and I was doing an oral interpretation of uh, dramatic literature. Where you you know you're working from the script, it's not original stuff, and we didn't have a speaker stand. And the the teacher, the professor from ETSU, came in and he was going to be the judge. And he said, "Okay, you all ready to get started?" And I said, "Excuse me, would, would it be possible for us to get a speaker stand?" He said, "Oh, you want it? You want a speaker stand? Do you want to hide behind it?" <laughs> and I went, "And here I, you know, I'm a sophomore in high school. No. Oh, you want to lean on it?" No. Well, why do you want it? And I said, just some place to put my notes. <laughs> and he went, okay, I'll see what I can do. Well, then, I don't think I won now. <laughs> but yeah, the, the idea of getting out behind the pulpit, of not having a physical, visual barrier between you and somebody else, um, to speak without notes. It's been consistently said that, uh, I think by, by many congregations, that they much prefer that. Actually, I had somebody preach for me one time here. And one of the comments that I heard later was, you know, he was really good. I really liked him. And, and it's like he didn't use his notes at all. And that was a big plus. Okay. Um, people, well, Cicero, Cicero is how you may know it, but in Latin it would be Cicero. One of the greatest of all Roman orators, he said this, in delivery, next to the voice in effectiveness is the countenance. That is, hey, face looks. And this is ruled over by the eyes. The expressive power of the human eye is so great that it determines in a manner the expression of the whole countenance. The eyes of the souls, you know, kind of thing. Um, it has been observed that Jesus and the apostles, by all, everything we can tell from Scripture, they did not use notes. They spoke directly, eye to eye, heart to heart, face to face, with the people. There is wide consensus among the very best preachers probably in the last 200 years. We talk about people like Charles Spurgeon and G. Campbell Morgan and, and folks like that. Almost to the person, they were extemporaneous speakers. Meaning, they did not use manuscripts. They did not use you know, extensive notes. At the very most, they would have short outlines or a few comments. Uh, one guy, D. 
Dean Charles R. Brown, uh, who's famous as an evangelist, he says, in my own practice, while I never used a manuscript in preaching, there are five sentences in my sermons that I always write out in advance and know by heart. The first one and the last four. If he knew the first sentence memorized from his sermon and the last four, that's all he needed. Otherwise, he spoke extemporaneously. Now, when I say speak extemporaneously, I don't mean have no notes at all. Charles Spurgeon, for instance, usually had, you know, had brief notes, but never looked at them. You know, they were in case he ever needed them, and he didn't. One of the great preachers of all time. And this has been consistently the case. Many, many, many of the most powerful preachers did not use written support when they were up there. So there's a strong motivation to say there is an advantage to speaking, to preaching, without notes. Um, and much of it has to do with the ability to have eye contact, especially in evangelistic sermons. To be able to look into people's eyes, to be able to relate to them directly. Now, you can still do that. I hope people get the sense that I have eye contact with them when I preach, even though I'm working from a full manuscript. Okay? Um, so you can do that. But John Wesley, for instance, said, look your audience decently in the face one after another as we do in a familiar conversation. Well, you can't look in people's faces. You can't have eye contact if your focus is down here. But you're worried where you are and what you're going to say next, and you know, etc. Um, I mentioned, the, I quoted the, the study earlier that people have a lot higher retention rate in terms of remembering what you say to them if you address them directly rather than if you read something to them. Um, so that's why I'm going to work on trying to speak from the middle of the platform without anything to lean on or hide behind. <laughs> All right, let's talk about um, other practical approaches to uh, memoria. The three keys to memoria, again, traditionally speaking, there are three. First, saturation. This is the real secret. This is the thing that is most important. Saturation means that you know, you really know what you're going to say before you get up there. Duh. <laughs> There are some people that when they preach or teach, you feel like they're hearing this themselves for the very first time. All right? And the less saturated you are, when I say saturation, I don't just mean saturated with the words you want to speak, but saturated with the content behind it. That you have immersed yourself in what do the related scriptures say, and what have the commentators said, or whatever, you know, what you really feel for that hour you are you know you are a minor expert on this sufficient that you feel comfortable getting up there now that doesn't mean you have to you know if you're preaching on on justification in romans that you have to be a theological authority on the book of romans or paul or, or justification you know like ready to write the book but um when i was preparing for the last series of talks i did on windstar cruises i was talking to Emily Teeter, who's the Egyptologist who was with us. And uh, we were talking about what my topics were going to be and what she was going to talk about, etc. We were going to send that in and they were, you know, ask them if there was anything else they wanted to do. And I said, yeah, if I get a little bit of advance notice if they want other talks, I can do that. I said, you know, I can be a 45-minute expert on almost anything with a little advance notice. <laughs> well, to some extent, not to make light of that, but that's exactly what we are when we stand up to preach, 20 to 30 minutes or whatever is for that 20 to 30 minutes, you have to be sufficiently saturated in that, that you, you are an expert to that extent. Not ready to write the definitive volume on it, whatever it is, but you have to know enough about it that you can speak with confidence, with authority. And so that's part of it is the saturation that you really have gotten into it. Have you completely immersed yourself in the topic and sermon? And that's why you don't do this in you know, one hour. You don't prepare effectively in one hour. Now, there is a cumulative historic effect. You know, people who study on a regular basis, who have immersed themselves in Scripture, who really, you've really worked at this kind of thing, then that doesn't mean you're starting from zero each time. You will, that's the case, I think, with Earl. Earl's been preaching and teaching for so long, he's got such a content of knowledge and memory and understanding that he doesn't have to go back and start from, you know, um, Genesis 1 in order to be able to deal with everything. He's got, he's got that content, so that's part of it. But have you really focused at the time immediately prior to that sermon on really absorbing, saturating yourself in what's out there? And how do you know if you've done it? How do you know if you're really ready? Oh, by the way, Kikoro, I just glanced down. Glanced down. I noticed. Uh, Kikoro, again, uh, 
probably the greatest orator ever. He said, no man can be eloquent on a subject that he does not understand. Duh. That's what saturation is about. You have to know, know that you understand it and be confident in that. Well, how do you know that if you're ready? First, what is your summary sentence? You are not ready to preach a sermon until you can, in one sentence, and I don't mean that, you know, I don't mean a 250 word sentence, in one reasonable sentence, say what your sermon is going to <laughs> communicate. One sentence. And this is something I used to teach when I taught preaching, uh, first year students. They would, usually after they would preach, I would, they would sit down and go, okay, Tell me in one sentence what your whole sermon was about. Well, it was more complicated than that. That's the problem. You have to be so clear as to what you're trying to do with that sermon, what you're trying to communicate, what you want people to get out of it, that you can express it well in one sentence. Until you're ready to give your sermon in one sentence, you're not ready to give it. Okay, well, if you can do it one sentence, why are you going to spend 30 minutes? Well, because you're going to repeat things, you're going to give them illustrations, you're going to emphasize it, you're going to, you know, build up support for it. But the basic point, you should say in one sentence. Right? That's a big way. That's, to me, the most important thing. In fact, if there's one other thing about preparing sermons that I think you need to know, it's that. Until you can give your sermon in one sentence, you're not ready to give your sermon. Okay? The second thing, which is related to it, you all are familiar with elevator speech, right? Uh, the analogy that they used to use, and I, and I use this in fundraising when I'm teaching people how to do major donor development. Um, I've told them, if, you, if you're working in Africa and you know, you've got a medical aspect to your, to your work there, and you're at a conference and you're standing waiting for the elevator, and Bill Gates walks up. And he's getting ready to get on the same elevator for you, and you know you're going to the 21st floor, so you've got like 90 seconds to tell him why the Gates Foundation ought to support you. Can you tell your whole story effectively in 90 seconds? That's your elevator speech. Whereas you need one sentence to say where you're going with your sermon. What's the per point of your sermon? What's the purpose of your sermon? Your elevator speech is, can you sit at your desk and in 90 seconds basically give your whole sermon, taking out all of the illustrations and the color and all that, but can you give a compelling, again, remember that example, you've got 90 seconds to convince the richest man in the world, or thereabouts, why he should support your work. 90 seconds. It's more than just one sentence, but it's not a 30-minute sermon. That's like the next... Development is you've got to say in one sentence what the point is, but you've got to be able in 90 seconds to really give the argument in a more a more complete way. If you can do those two things, then you are ready, or you've got a pretty good feeling that you are ready to give your sermon, that you really know what it is you're trying to say. Is that fair? Make sense? And those really are disciplines that you should you should uh, pursue. That's, this, this isn't just sort of, well, that's a cute idea. Do it. It really works. All right? Gates uh, is the number one man uh, for three years. Well, yeah. At any given time, they'll say it's Carlos Slim or it's or Warren <laughs> Buffett or, you know, whatever. Yeah. So that's Carlos why Slim is number two this year. Yeah, well, they, they come out like every month. And they'll yes. say, oh, he's bad. Oh, <laughs> yeah. The difference, you know, billion here or billion there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. Real money. <laughs> Quote every Dirksen. That's right. <laughs> okay. Now, the only way you get to really know is you've got to spend the time. Saturation is not a quick process. The very word implies that it seeps in and soaks in. So you have got to spend the time. The basic principle is you spend a little time, you get a little benefit in terms of what your audience gets out of it. Um, so the, the procedure is you decide on your sermon topic early, you begin studying it and meditating it on it every day, you let it grow, and then once you've really soaked yourself in this and really know where you're going and what you're doing, then you sit down and you write the outline, or in my case, the manuscript. Um, and one thing too, 
If some of you decide that God has called you to more <coughs> ministry and you, or to a, a regular ministry of teaching and preaching, and this is something that I struggle with. I'm going to tell you what I believe is the truth, even though uh, it's difficult. Um, the main business of a preacher should be to preach. <laughs> And yet, there are 10,000 other distractions. You can start a theological institute. <laughs> or, you know, you can get involved in outreach ministries or whatever. All of those are very critically important and valuable. I am not denigrating those. But at a certain point, a preacher or a teacher, either one, has to say, this is my main job. And I need to find other people who can do some of that stuff. The more you let that other stuff occupy your energy and time, the less you're going to spend on preaching and the, the worse you're going to be at, or the less effective you're going to be at. Now, I always say the sermon is not the point of Sunday morning. People, you know, I had somebody say to me recently that they were talking to somebody and they said, you know, they were so, somebody was talking and they said, you know, and I told them afterwards that you're here to hear the sermon, that's why you came today. And I went, we're here to experience God, and we can do that through the prayers, we can do that through the readings, we can do that through a lot of things. But human nature being what it is, and I don't think I've openly, I've admitted this to more than Carolyn before, is churches grow based upon the preaching. I mean, there has to be other things too. There has to be, people have to feel welcome, you know, people are attracted to other things, but ultimately, in the Western world, churches grow or decline based upon what's coming out of the pulpit. And I wish that were not so. But it is. Um, and so, strong churches generally are a product of a strong pulpit ministry. That doesn't mean you can let the other stuff slide. And it certainly doesn't mean the person that's in that pulpit can allow themselves to get prideful or, you know, over over full of themselves. There have been several things in Christianity recently. You know Mars Hill Ministry in Seattle? I mean, they actually spread all over. Mark Driscoll yeah. had to step down because of pride. I mean, apparently he was impossible to deal with. He was a butt. And nobody could get along with him. His board couldn't get along with him. He had been thrown out of several ministerial associations because of his attitude about things. And he has confessed. I'm saying that he's confessed his own pridefulness, his own being full of himself, well, he had an extraordinary ministry of preaching and teaching, and that's gone now because he got so full of himself. And he's, I'm quoting him now, he admits that. So, yeah, you can't go too far with that. But the fact is, a church that has wonderful people and a lot of other wonderful stuff and bad preaching is probably not going to grow too much. And it hurts me to say that. Go ahead. Uh, what would be your definition of preaching? versus teaching? Um, you'll get that when you go back and see the first, first classes. Okay. okay. But no, I'll, I'll say it again because it's important. Okay. Teaching is primarily, not exclusively, but primarily intended for cognitive knowledge. Teaching is for the uh, purpose of imparting knowledge that was not known before. Preaching is for the purpose of changing lives by touching the heart by convincing people that lives need to be changed. That doesn't mean that preaching does not have some informational content, nor does it mean that teaching can't change lives. But in terms of the orientation of them, teaching communicates cognitive knowledge, preaching changes people's lives by touching their heart. And the example I always use to give people an understanding of that is, to me one of the great sermons that was ever preached, at least in our time, is the I Had a Dream sermon by Dr. Martin Luther King. There is no informational content in that. He did, not, he did not survey the historical experience of the civil rights movement. He did not you know, tell us you know, what it was like to be Rosa Parks. Or, or, but when he said, I have a dream of a day when my children are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, there's no informational content in that. And yet I get goosebumps every time I say those words. It changed lives of a, practically a whole generation of people. And that's the difference. That's a sermon. That's not a teaching. Fair? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, if God is calling you to preach, preach. Doesn't mean you cannot do, I mean, some of the best preachers in America, um, that's all they do. I mean, uh, 
and sometimes unreasonably so. <laughs> I work with a preacher. I helped create a radio show for a preacher whose name I will not mention, so you don't have to edit this out. Thank you. <laughs> we created a radio show, and he's a brilliant preacher, but they were paying him $100,000 a year and providing him all sorts of other benefits for preaching once a week. No office hours, no counseling, no nothing. It was more than a hundred. Wasn't it two hundred thousand? Uh, I think it was two hundred thousand. Yeah. Two hundred thousand. That's oh, what it was. Goodness. And this was fifteen years ago. Yeah. Twenty years ago. Yeah. Two hundred thousand dollars a year. And he preached for thirty minutes a week. No other responsibilities. And he was pretty demanding in that. So you can recognize who that was. On the video. Mm -hmm. Oh wait. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think that's a little too much. I think that, that pastors, preachers, preacher pastors have responsibilities to do other things too. That they're obligated, you know, almost equal to preaching to provide leadership and vision. That that's part of it. But sometimes they do have to say no in order for this to be the primary thing that they're going to do. Right? So the first tenet or key to memory is saturation. The second is organization. I sort of suggested this earlier, and that means to have your sermon in their or your thoughts, organized and structured so that the, your content and main points not only communicate well, but they're easier for you to follow yourself. So, a poorly structured sermon does not communicate well, and you're not clear where you are at any given time. It's hard for you to deliver. A well-organized sermon is both easier for the people to understand, and it's easier for you to know where you are in order to deliver it. Um, one preacher said, the better the outline, the greater the likelihood that it's, it, of its not being needed in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. If you've outlined well, if there's a clear structure and organization, then it should sort of come nat much more naturally to you. And so, you know, the better outline you have, the less likely you're going to have to look at it. Because cognitively, you'll be much more aware. Um, one professor of preaching when asked what was the greatest lack after 30 years of teaching preaching, he said lack of content. <laughs> you know, they're not saying anything. And, but he said, but very close to that, I say very near second is poor organization. That they don't have a clear flow from where they're going. And I, I think that if there's, if, if there's something that I sort of naturally fall into is, there, and this is why it's hard for me to write an outline that I find myself writing whole pages of things is because I write one thing and I have a my writing leads me into the next thing, you know, so that I have transitions and I have connecting material. And so because that's my inclination, my stuff tends to be well organized, but it's very hard for me to just do an outline and not a whole script. A whole manuscript. Okay. So if I had to do a trade-off, I'd rather that. Rather than be disorganized and be able to do outlines. And I'd be rather be where I am. Um, One process that has often been advocated, and this is true when you're writing anything, if you're writing a paper, you're writing a book, or whatever, start with one sentence representing each major, major paragraph. You know, as an outline. Start with one sentence and just say, this sentence represents what I want to say in this, and this sentence represents the second paragraph, so this sentence represents the third paragraph. And then, once you've really worked on that and got that, said, yes, the, the, the flow works, because it's easier to have to see the flow if you're just doing one sentence for each paragraph. Once you really feel like that's polished and that works, and that can be your outline, but then if you want the full manuscript, again for publication or distribution or whatever, go back and just work with that one sentence and you'll find it's very easy to put the rest of the stuff in, you know, to sharpen the corners and to have the connecting material and all that. So that's one process. Um, some of the organization has to do with how you, present, how you take it into the pulpit. We're going to deal with that more next week when we talk about presentatio, how you do the presentation. Various people have different, different things. Uh, people who work in homiletics and, and communication, some people say, you know, use a spiral bound notebook and, you know, and that's not very big. Some people say use a loose leaf notebook pages. Some say take an eight and a half by 11 and fold it in half so that you've got, you know, four, four half size pages. Um, what I was taught and what I absolutely believe in is don't do anything where the, the, the pieces of paper you're going to be dealing with are connected. Because I believe that visually it's very distracting to see that. Okay? I don't think you see that when you see me preaching or teaching because all of my stuff is loose pages and when I need to change, you know, to move the page over, um, you don't see the page. You may see my hand move, but you're not going to see the piece of paper move because it's all loose. 
I believe that's a much better way. It's visually not as distracting. And so all of these other recommendations people make about spiral bound or folded piece of paper, whatever, I think loose sheets that you can just slide over when you need to. Have you ever Carol. gotten your pages out of order? Um, well, I check before I, before I get up there that they're not out of order. Um, one thing I have had happen is Ernest Gabber carried off part of my talk one time, you know, my, my <laughs> He was up there to read, you know, to read the scripture, and we walked away with, Ernest, come back up here, I got some of my stuff, because you know, he picked his stuff up and took some of my with it. But, uh, you know, there are inherent dangers, but I think that overall, that's like the only problem I'm able to wear. I, I actually printed, I was in a hurry one time, and I printed my sermon, and realized that the printer, you know, you know how it is when sometimes it prints pages it put yes. two through at once? Yes. And so I had the bottom of this sheet, you know, and then that one, but it was all there. Ah. It was just, you know, and so I just had to, one more piece of paper to play with. But no, I haven't had other problems with it. Yes? Uh, the thing that I found out, uh, I had to number my pages. Mm. Yeah. Because I had, uh, one time I had, they turned the fans on. Mm. <laughs> all the, you know, like, Ten pages were just like all over, yep. but then you can scoop it all up and yep. right back. Yeah, I mean there are sensible little things like number of pages. Number of pages. And I have when I when I anything that I do on a, a repeated basis, I always copy over you know the the, the previous, usually the previous, mm -hmm. as a format, which means my all of my class notes are always always numbered. Uh, all of my sermons are always numbered. The pages that I use, in fact, I, next week. Next week or the week after, maybe applying the principles when I'll do this. I will bring you, you've seen the sermon, I will bring you uh, an order of worship that I use. Because in addition to having the full man, uh, sermon manuscripted, I have the whole order of service from the invocation, you know, from the welcome and announcements, it just says that, but then everything else is scripted and it's in numbered pages. And what I do is I prepare all that first and it's got the readings and everything else is on there. So if somebody else forgets something, I've got that. And then when I when I print out the sermon, I just insert the sermon, at, you know, before the the Thanksgiving of tithes and offerings, and and, uh, and and go from there. But I'll share that with you all in terms of how I prepare the whole order of worship. And again, once I've done it, you know, I've got all that stuff set up. Then it's not as you look at that, you go, man, that's a lot of work. It's not nearly as much work if you use the template from the previous week and you just go in and you make the changes. Okay, Stan. What about using an iPad or something like that? Well, that's um, that's becoming much more common. The only thing about um, iPad, and it's the same reason why there's problems with electronic books, and again, nobody loves e-books more than Carolyn and I do. I'm on my ninth one. Uh, but there are limitations in terms of you can't. It's hard to go back and forth. You know, you see what you see, and it's it's like when you don't ever get a cookbook, um, you know, or a textbook just on that if you want, if it's something you need to refer back to or look for on, et cetera, because it's hard. More and more people are using iPads, and I've even read little articles that said, here are the things you need to make sure that you, you know, that you do. Turn off the, any alarms you have. You know, you're writing a little sermon, beep, 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 and you're, you know, you're doing this, right? You have done that? Or yeah, there are various other things. Or you know, you depending upon how long you've got the um, you know the how the power settings are. You know, you you decide that you're really going to emphasize a certain point, and you glance down, and your screen's gone dark. So they're I think they're great, and I have actually considered the possibility of going more to tablet because I can. Carol will tell you, but my tablet's right here. I've got my tablet in my hands most of my waking hours, and I thought of going to that, but. There, there are limitations where you, the old technology of paper uh, is really advantageous. Um, so if I ever do, I'll probably, what I'll do is I'll do, do the traditional way and have that there and try using the tablet. But yeah, I would like to go in that direction, uh, save a tree. It's seven minutes after. Let's take a break for about eight minutes. All right, let's talk about the third of the approaches, which is memorization. There is no escaping the need to remember, and that means memorize. Memorize just means remember and, you know, and don't forget. <laughs> That's all that means. To memorize at least key points and passages from your sermon. You have to know it well enough that, and again, if you've got one sentence, remember, you know, you've, got, you've got your summary sentence, you've got your 90-second elevator speech, 
What does that mean other than that you are so clearly, you know, have that it's so much a part of you that you can talk about these things without having to refer to anything. You need to memorize the key points, like the fellow I quoted that said, you know, he always wrote down five sentences, the first sentence in a sermon of the last four, and then he memorizes them. He's got them with him, but you memorize those things. Um, it's been estimated that of these three things, saturation, organization, and memorization, as key approaches to memory, that half of your total effort should be saturation in terms of the time span. That is, completely absorbing yourself in, in what the topic is and what your sermon's about. The next 40% is an organization, making sure that you are being succinct, you are not you know, being too florid in your talk, you're keeping it within reasonable time. Um, if I have one pet peeve when it comes to hearing preachers, it's it's people who just, you know, Carol and I don't get to hear many other preachers because we're here all the time. But we were at one church and I heard a preacher and afterwards I said, yeah, you know, that was a great 20 minute sermon, but the problem was he took 45 minutes to give it. <laughs> well, that's a sign of not a bad organization. That he, he was going all over the place. And so 40% is organization and then 10% is memorization. So half saturation, 50%. 40% organizing it well, and then 10% memorizing it, making sure that you really, and so it's not a huge part of it, but it is a critical part. Now, when I say memorize, I don't mean only that you store it in your memory by memory cards or whatever. By the way, that's a process that I really would love to be able to pursue and use and learn from. Um, so I want to try that sometime. Um, but that you have some way of being able to recall it either by having it all in your mind and being able to bring it out, or more often that you have it um, in front of you in some way you can use it. Now, in terms of memorizing the stuff, having it in your mind, there are three sort of keys, which I have up here, which have always been understood as being the right way to memorize things. They are impression, association, and repetition. Impression means to Spend time with the whole thing in a way that you really are using all of your senses. And I, we talked before, I think, about um, every, every sense that you use allows you to experience something in a different way. If you read something with your eyes, you are using a different part of the brain than if you hear it. And you are using still a different part of the brain if you speak it, as you hear yourself talking. You are using a different part of the brain if you write it. And so the idea when we talk about impression is to use as many of your senses as you can in, make, in, in getting, absorbing this thing. Um, people who do memorization, you know, like actors, actresses, politicos, uh, those sorts of folks, they will frequently start out with the script and they will read the script in full, you know, and really spend time reading it and thinking about it and absorbing it. Then they'll copy it out longhand. This, not everybody does this, but this is common. They'll copy the script out longhand. Then they will record it in their own voice so they're speaking it. Then they will play the recording back over and over and over again so that they're hearing it. And then they will sit down, and this is if they're trying to really memorize it, and they will write it out again from memory to make sure they got it right. Well, in that sort of process, you're reading it with your eyes, you're speaking it with your voice, you're writing it out, you're hearing it with your ears, okay, you see you're getting all these different senses. That's the way to begin to lock these things in. Yes? I was going to say what we also do is uh, we, we um, do association by where we're standing. Mm -hmm. And it might be you may hold your pen at a certain time or, or where you, on a stage you place yourself and it helps very much with the memorization. Right. So perhaps there's something in the pulpit that... Right, and that's real, that gets into the association. The yes. idea that you associate particular things. That's where the memory palace comes in. That, and that's how the memorization of people's names, that's how they recommend it. That you associate a, a name, series of numbers, a sermon, with particular kinds of things, either... Um, for instance, you can do a memory palace kind of thing if you're preaching, if you're always preaching in the same place, where you think in terms of different locations in the back, you know, where you're looking at the back of the of the congregation, you know, the, the, and, and use those as the locations. The idea of association is that you actually associate a physical location with something you're trying to remember. And again, that uses a different part of the brain. The reason that works 
why memory palace or method uh, loci works is the, the, our spatial memory for most people is one of the most reliable. Okay, we we have a sense of things in relationship to one another in the physical world. We have a tendency to remember those things more easily than we do concepts, physical things in the world. And so, if you can link those physical spatial uh, identities or things with concepts in your talk or something as random and abstract as a series of numbers, sixty-five thousand plus digits of a pie, then you are more likely to, to remember it because you're using a different part of the brain that tends to be more reliable. It's as simple as that. But that's consistent with the idea of the impression. You, you, when you use different senses, you use different parts of the brain. And so you therefore have more, you know, there are more synapses that you can call on to help you remember this stuff. Um, and the third thing is, is repetition. When I say they play, you know, they record it, they play it back over and over and over and over again, the repetition is very valuable in that. So those are some of the ways that you can proceed with memorizing. And again, whether it is memorizing in total or it's memorizing concepts and outline key points, um, whichever approach you take to that, that, this can be very valuable. Now, one of the other things which all people who deal with studying will tell you is how do most people, say they've got a big test to take, how do most people prepare for that? Read their notes. Really? Writing out. You guys, you writing guys, it out. You're awfully, either awfully good or awfully optimistic. How do most cram. college cram? We have oh, a word for it. <laughs> they read their notes. Oh, cram. Yeah. <laughs> you guys read your notes. You read your notes. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Those things are true, but most people, the approach they take is the night before, they drink too much coffee in a Red Bull and they stay up all night and they try to remember it all at the last minute, right? Well, some people prepare sermons that way. Um, I tend to prepare sermons that way. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, I was confessing all sorts of things earlier. You weren't here. <laughs> now, it's not that I don't spend time on them. I do all week, but then I, you know, busy with things, whatever. You know, it's, I'm still cogitating. And so I do too much of it at the last minute. That's something I need to change. Okay? But by the time I get it all down, I have spent a lot of time in advance with it. I don't just wait till the last minute and go, oh, wow, it's 9 o'clock on Saturday. I wonder what I'm going to preach tomorrow. <laughs> now, some people do that. Some people, I think, get in the pulpit and go, oh, so what am I going to say? Uh, well, the fact is that even if, whenever, whenever you do it, trying to do it all at once is a bad idea. Because that's not how you're going to be able to really absorb it, have clear organization, or remember it. It is much better to, and all the studies have shown this, if you spend 15 minutes you know, a day for five days, you will get more product than if you spent you know, an hour and 15 minutes at one time. And, and as one, one scholar that I read said, it is very possible to study yourself stupid. <laughs> I can't absorb anymore right now. It's just not going in. It's not there. Well, you know what? You wait till the last minute and you don't have any choice, then you're in trouble. It is much better to plan to spend some time spaced out. Spaced out. <laughs> to spread your time out in different, different uh, study times and to have you know breaks, even, even to do it on multiple days. You will learn more, you will retain more, you will understand more, you will be able to respond better than if you try to do it all at once. And, and that means even if you're doing it on Monday before you have to preach on Sunday, don't do it all at once. Spread it out. You will learn more and you'll be better at it. Okay? So that's part of the, the uh, memor memorization stuff too. Now let me give you some other practical approaches to memoria, sort of putting all this together. First, forget what Socrates said, it's all right to use notes, <laughs> really. But without dependence on notes is much better. There are, I mean, there are some people who, who seem to effectively be able to read, but not one in 10,000 can read effectively. Right? Um, that's, that's not what you ought to be shooting for. And since we're in the process of learning how to do this the best way possible, don't plan on reading. And don't, don't plan on developing a process where even though there's nothing against having notes, in fact, you should have notes, in case you forget where you are or who you are, 
or you know you get lost um, to have something to fall back on maybe you know maybe you had a crisis in your church the night before and you're exhausted and you didn't really have time to finish your preparation then notes are going to be your your lifeline so there is nothing wrong with having notes but you should not plan on developing a habit of being dependent on your notes I, I feel confident saying even though I work from a full manuscript and I work from page one to page seven or so uh, through the thing if somebody took my notes away from me, I still could do a fairly decent job of presenting the sermon. So I don't think I have a dependency on them. You know, I can do better. I've, com I've, I've verbally committed to you all that I'm going to start trying to do that differently. Okay? But it is okay to have notes. But it'll be better if you're not dependent on your notes. It'll be better of all if, you know, your notes are there in case you have to have them, but you don't plan on using them. Uh, someone has said that the only people who should be allowed to have notes are, notes are the people who really don't need them. Um, that's sort of the principle. I believe all of us as preachers will be more effective when we don't have to stand by the pulpit and don't have to have notes in front of us all the time. One of the things that I'm, I was thinking about doing in the new church, and I haven't just, I've been questioning it now, I haven't decided for sure, is to put a third, we'll have two large projection screens, like 8 by 12 projection screens that are church and large projectors. Carol and I picked those up this next weekend. Um, and one of the things I consider doing for my sake and for the sake of the choir who are going to be facing toward the congregation is that we have a third screen on the back wall of the sanctuary with a separate projector. And then we can put the words of the sermon up there and then I can project an outline so that I really can't wander around. And uh, but do I even want to do that? That's what I'm, I'm beginning to question as I've worked on this. So that's been my, my thought all along. It's not going to happen immediately. Because those projectors are darn expensive. Uh, the ones that are that are capable to project in that kind of environment. Yes. Being there and experienced a preacher doing just that um, with like several hundred people in the congregation. And I was part way back, a good way back in front of the church. And it seemed to me that the preacher was Looking okay, over my head the whole time. He was not a six foot tall man. And he was not a dynamic personality, so he didn't fill the whole stage with his present right. presence. Um, I think it was a good idea in that he had a short time frame because he had multiple church services, and so he could stick to his points and deliver what he wanted to deliver and not get sidetracked. But I had the feeling he was. Well, then I, I don't think he was doing it the way he should. For instance, for me, when I talk about projecting like the outline, to me it would be that I'm going to be speaking to the people in the congregation and making eye contact and stuff, and then just be able to glance up and say, okay, where, where am I going next, you know, in case, I, in case I get lost. So it would only be a cue. It would not be that I'm looking at this all the time. And time, time. Able to he had his yeah. whole service up there, because yeah. I turned around and checked. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, so for me, it really would be like a teleprompter. Oh, teleprompters yeah. today, you know, it, it's not a teleprompter. It's not like it's, it's running through it and I'm taking the script off of that. It's a lifeline. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically my way of saying if I, you know, if, if I forget where I am or where I'm going, I can glance up and very quickly see, mm -hmm. rather than have to be over here behind the pulpit, which is where my notes are. Okay, so we'll yeah. see. Yeah. So that will be the next thing that we, we develop. Okay, it is okay to use notes, but... It is not okay to be dependent upon notes to the point that you really aren't able to relate directly to people. Next, you have to find the style that works for you. While most, most great preachers have said, and most congregations that have experienced this would agree, that, that preachers who are not bound to their notes or to a pulpit are better, that sort of gets trumped by the fact that whoever the preacher is, they have to have a style that works for them. In the, in the same way that, as I say, when I try to outline something, I just can't. Because the words start pouring out of me, and I start thinking of illustrations and stuff, thinking, you know, I've got six or seven pages worth of written text. I go, darn it! That's not an outline! And I've done that dozens of times. And so, at a certain point, I have to say, that apparently is who I am. So, you have to decide on what your style is, on what works for you. Are you a memorizer? You know, you do the script and you memorize it. Are you a scribbled noter? You know, like I, I, I mentioned to you, Earl Palmer just writes a few words on each side of a one sheet of eight and a half by 11 yellow uh, pad. Are you an outliner? Are you a full text in, the, in the, the pulpit person? What are you? Once you figure that out, go with it. 
Now, in my case, I'm comfortable the way I do it, but I think I can do it better, and so I'm prepared to take some risks. Hopefully the congregation is prepared to take some risks with me. <laughs> we'll find out. Okay, but you have, to, you have to be comfortable with this is what works for you, and there are different ways to approach it. I don't think you should plan on trying to be one somebody who wings it, because that's just irresponsible. Okay. But, as I say, reading your sermon is not a style, it's generally not acceptable. You have to work at it harder than that. Right? Again, if you, if you write the whole thing out, I say this because this is how I do it, and then you know it well enough and you're comfortable enough that you can get out there and you've got it all in front of you, but it's not obvious to everybody that you've got a full text because you're not just reading it, that's okay. You know, that will work. I think some of the things work better. I think not being trapped to that is probably better, so we'll see. Um, generally speaking, working from a one-quarter outline of written notes is probably the best and easiest approach based upon a lot of people's experience. One-quarter outline means that your outline is, is one quarter of the length of what the full text of that sermon would be. So that you have taken paragraphs, each paragraph is represented by one sentence, you know, each illustration is represented by two or three words, but you know the illustration well enough that that's all you need. So that you're dealing with, it, with an outline that is about one quarter of what the full text would be if you wrote it all out. Okay? And that's fairly universally accepted as being the, the easiest and probably best approach to the, to in the absence of something else. If you've not already developed a style, then that's the one that probably you should work toward. Because more people say that works well than anything else. It's, it's less demanding in terms of... See, and one of the things they often say is, um, if, you, if you write your whole sermon, like what I do, and then you try to turn it into an outline, the tendency is to become more focused on the specific words than on the concepts or themes, or thoughts. And so there's a danger in that, and you have to be very careful, I'll have to be very careful not to do that. But um, the point is you're trying to boil it down to something that's not going to take up as much, and that, that you then have the ability to be more extemporaneous in terms of your own presentation. You're looking at people, you're looking in the faces, you have eye contact. Now, um, you weren't in here, Carol, but I already told the story that I had to learn early on when I was teaching every week that it did not work as well for me to try to, to come up with every illustration, every example, every story, etc. If I tried to overplan that, it fell flat. And so this idea of being extemporaneous and being able to deal with examples as they come up, I know the value of that. And that's one of the things I want to try to capture in my preaching in the way that I feel that I've been able to use it in teaching. But um, just have to work on it. Right? The fourth thing has to do with outlining and highlighting. Assuming that you are going to work uh, from an outline, you need to, within your outline, identify the things that are your key concepts or your key thoughts, and they need to be bold in there. They need to be your headers. They need to be highlighted, or in other ways, really made clear. Again, for me in manuscript, uh, the, things, the, the tools that I use right now, there's three of them, to help me understand what I want to emphasize are one, bold face, like for headings. Um, there's actually four. Bold face, all caps, underlining, and increasing the type font size. It's funny, a lot of the books that, I, that I've reviewed uh, for preparing this and for other things I've done in preaching uh, tend to be very much older. And they're all talking about um, handwriting. No, don't type it, because if you type it, you don't have the options of, you know, making things bigger or whatever. I'm like, well, yeah, right. <laughs> I can do anything. Okay, exactly. Um, and, yeah, exactly. So I tap it out and carve it out in stone. Um, so that's one of the advantages with, with uh, you know, computers. You can create, you can indent any way you want. You can, you, you can actually highlight on the computer. You've got enough yellow ink in your cartridge, which I don't right now. Um, or whatever color you want to highlight in. But those, for me, I, I, I don't use colors anymore. Not because I have any serious problem with it. I do use colors when I'm class notes. I highlight stuff, all right? Um, but generally speaking on sermons, I use bold face, all caps, underline, larger type, and then, you know, I, I, I usually will indent the start of each paragraph, but because I'm, if I was working with an outline, I'd use different indentations. But I usually 
just indent paragraphs or you know break them up that way. I will usually italicize quotes, you know, and bold face them. So I, you know, particularly if it's a quote I want to read, and if it's a quote in a sermon, I probably want to read it. Uh, so I pick up those things. But um, you need to think about how you would use all of those things: indentation, underscoring, uh, using of numerals, not letters, and, and using numbers like Rome. If you're doing an outline, Roman numerals for the main heads, and then like uh, Arabic numerals, rather than use letters, because when you're glancing down at something, the, if the, the sections are led by letters, that's the same as what your type is. It helps to use numbers because then they don't, your eye doesn't blend them in with everything else. Carolyn? The um, book, is it McDill? McDill, is that our author? Yeah. He doesn't like a whole lot of outlining. He doesn't like sub points and sub, sub, sub points. He's not, he only really, want you to have your main points. Is well, that and again, that's there? a difference in style. Um, I'm not recommending that you have like five levels of subpoints. You know, this is not a thesis, uh, you know, outline you're doing. Um, it says that your audience gets lost. It's true. It's, it's, it's pretty much universally accepted that if you have more than five points, then it's too much. But there's also nothing sacred about three points. Mm -hmm. Um, which is the traditional, all right? Uh, there have been various, there have been people who printed thousands of, of outlines for sermons that are all three point sermons, all right? <laughs> I can remember when I started as a freshman in, in college, we all had to take a class called Man in the Arts, which was a basic introduction in humanities class. And they had various things you had to do. And again, I had done a lot of, in high school, I had done a lot of speech stuff, competitive speaking. So I get there, and one of the first things they're talking about the assignments that we're going to have to fulfill during the during the year. And one of them is said, they said you have we have to do a 1.3 minute speech. And I thought 1.3 minutes? That's all the finely detailed. I mean, 1.3 minutes. What if it's 1.4 minutes or 1.2 minutes? They meant um, a one point speech that takes three minutes. <laughs> But they said a 1.3 minute speech, and I was thinking 1.3. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, but three points is like the standard. It doesn't have to be three points, but if it gets more than five points, or if you've got, you know, if you've got three subheads under one point, then you're getting way too detailed, certainly for that one. People are not going to retain that, and in that regard, I completely agree with the book. In terms of the outline, you know, if your organization is good, which means you don't have nine points and you don't have five levels of subpoints under each one, that's bad organization. That gets back to that, that issue. But if you've got it well organized and well thought out, you don't have too much detail like that, then whether you have just point, 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 and that's it, or you've got point and two subs, point and two subs, point and three subs, that's not a matter of organization then. It's a matter of what do you need to make sure you are able to use that outline to present effectively? Okay? If, if your sermon has too many points and subpoints, it's, it's a bad organization. If your outline has too many points and subpoints, it's going to be hard to follow, and so it's bad organization. So either way, don't get too detailed. But also, there are no you know, absolute hard and fast rules um, on that sort of thing. How many points can you have either in your sermon or on your outline. Uh, particularly when you do an outline, you want to identify points and then cues. A point is, is the point you want to make. And you want to write it in as few words as possible, but it's basically the whole thing. A cue is blue elephant story. Right? Which is just, it cues me as to what I want to say there, or what I want to talk about, the illustration I want to give, or whatever. It doesn't actually tell the blue elephant story. But a point would be, you know, Jesus is the only way to salvation. Okay, that's not a cue, that's a point. Now I will expand on that when I'm actually doing the sermon if that's in my outline. But that's the points and cues are two of the things you want to deal with um, in your outline. So, concepts or thoughts are your bold headers. Key words, you might want to put those in the margins or bold face them and use them and type and outline them. Now, the difference in that is a, a, a concept or a thought is something you're going to develop. A key word is a word that you've decided carries importance in itself. I want to make sure I get that word in there, a concept or a thought. I may not use exactly what it is I have on my outline, but if it's a key word, that means that that word in itself has some weight, and I want to make sure I get that in there, okay? Word or words. Um, 
And, and often what I will do is, there's certain words I will repeat for emphasis. If I'm going to repeat them for emphasis, then I put them, and I repeat them in, that, in, in the script, or I would in an outline, if I did an outline. Um, work your outline down to a minimum number of lines and a few pages. Again, one line per paragraph is the usual rule of thumb. Spend 50% more time on the sermon outline uh, than you think you need, but not all at once and not all at the last minute, or you will cook your brain. It just doesn't work well, right? Now again, I, I confess to you, I spend more time on Saturdays and on Sunday mornings before church than I should, but I'm not cook at that point, I'm not really cooking my brain because what I'm doing is I'm refining something I've been working on all week. So it's not like I'm waiting till the last minute and then just absolutely cramming, crashing to try to get this stuff done. Um, and I think that to a very great extent, we should shoot for being free from dependence on any kind of written material. It doesn't mean you don't have notes up there with you. But it means that the ideal is that you have them there in case something happens and you need them, but but you don't really need them. Again, quote, the only person who should have notes in the pulpit is the person who doesn't really need them. So work, work toward that. I'm going to, and you guys can hold me accountable for that. Questions about any of this stuff? Can I make a little comment? Sure. Maybe you heard this, and if you did, you can expand on it. There was this minister, and he was giving a sermon and the sermon was if you're hooked on drugs take them and throw them in the river if you're hooked on alcohol take the the alcohol and throw it in the river and then the choir got up to sing shall we gather by the river <laughs> <laughs> so you, you didn't mention anything about the choir <laughs> yeah um, i didn't but <laughs> The, it, it, this varies from church to church. In the Presbyterian churches, the Book of Order says that the, the pastor is responsible for everything that happens in the worship service. And that includes music. It doesn't mean that you know you have to write it. <laughs> it doesn't even mean you have to choose it. In fact, what we do is I, Carolyn chooses the music, and because there's always factors like what do they know, how do we introduce them to, to new music, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's always, always concerns. Um, what's the choir comfortable singing and leading them? Um, so there are a lot of things about that. And, you know, Carolyn is musical. I am not I mean, singing, but that's about it. Um, so I prepare my sermon topics. And usually, you know, we have series. Uh, Carolyn's aware of that. And I've not, not done as good a job of letting her know in advance of that as possible. I mean, the last time, you know, but she also creates the bulletins, bulletin covers for our church. And so she knows the, not only the topic, but the, the bulletin, the, the scripture verse that I'm going to be focusing on. And so the selection of music ideally will go along with that. Um, certainly would not be inconsistent with that. And it's possible that, you know, like there's an example where it really isn't going to, going to fit together. So that's a concern. But that really is a different, that's, that's like being responsible for the overall worship rather than preaching. And so we're focusing more just on the preaching task. There is, there is a lot of coordination that's taking place. Should be. Um, that, <laughs> there should be. <laughs> should be. Um, the, uh, the idea of coordinating readers, for instance, and all of that kind of stuff. Getting the readings up. There's a lot of those detailed kind of things. In fact, I may talk about that the last week when we talk about applying the principles the hour before the final, which you're all going to enjoy. The, um, <laughs> and you get to take next week. Um, <laughs> well, not next week, it's the week after. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll give you copies of Order of Worship, and you can see how I do it. And it's certainly not the only way to do it, uh, but my tendency is to, is, is more is more. <laughs> I put it all down, and then I have the freedom to walk away from that at any given moment if I wish to or need to. But I don't ever, have, I don't ever get to a point where I go, well, what are we going to do next? And in fact, I have the inside of the bulletin is always taped on the bulletin. Uh, and I think in five plus years, I probably glanced at that twice. And yet I still put it there every week. Um, so that I know it's there in case I have a slip or something looks wrong in my in my full order of worship notes. Glance up there and I've got the outline in effect, which is from the from the bulletin. 
it's more important that I we do next to what the bulletin says we're going to do next than what I want to do next because that's what everybody's expecting. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about that. Talking about what everybody's expecting, this is relating to past Sunday service. We didn't do any decrees. We didn't repeat any decrees. Was there a particular reason, or is it just um, we have a time frame? We have a particular schedule. Of the first Sunday of every month, we do communion. The mm -hmm. second Sunday, we do the Apostles' Creed in that same time period. The third Sunday, we do the Nicene Creed, and then if we, uh, fourth Sunday and fifth Sunday, if there is one. We may do other things, like sometimes we have witness to the working of God, where we'll have somebody give a word of witness. I haven't done that in a while. Uh, unless I have something else I feel like we really want or need to do right there, then we just, you know, we go on. Because we tend to go five or ten minutes too long anyway, so it doesn't hurt to get that back. But that's, uh, we have a particular schedule for when we use the creeds, and it's on the second and third Sundays. So that's yeah. I wondered, because when I, ever I went to the Presbyterian Church back home, we always, always recited yeah. Every Sunday. Exactly. And that the reason the reason we do that, first Sunday communion, second Sunday Apostles Creed, third Sunday Nicene Creed, is because that's the way they were doing it when I came here. Oh. And I have no what and I have no I don't have any difficulty with it. And no a new minister when they come in, changing things just because you want to change things is not a good idea. And so things that I was comfortable with, things like the fact that we sing the, the Gloria Patri in English and in Spanish. I thought that was great. I saw no reason. So there are things like that I saw no reason to fiddle with. Um, and continuity is important. I think one of the greatest things that gets gets ministers in trouble is when they come to a church and they think they have got to remake them. everything there over in their own image. I had no desire to do that. And so the things that I thought worked well, I mean, we changed a lot um, when we got here. But those things, that's not a reason to change. Any other questions? I hope this has been helpful for you in terms of kind of very practical sorts of stuff. Thank you.